to run from the Lord. He wanted nothing to do with this message uh, to Nineveh. And this afternoon, we're going to pick up from there and start in verse 4 and uh, make it hopefully to verse 16. So I would just like to read Jonah 1 with you again, and we'll go from there. So beginning at verse 1 of Jonah 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain of the guard came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you, that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Kids, have you ever done something that you really hope your parents won't find out. Perhaps you're worried that they're going to know what you've done, and you try to keep it a secret. Maybe you go hide somewhere in your basement or in a closet, hoping you're not found out. Well, it's not just kids who do that. It's adults who can do that as well. We often live life hoping that God doesn't see what we're doing. We'd rather not have him peer into our hearts 
or our actions. In fact, oftentimes we'd rather not have others see what we're doing as well. Quite often we would sooner see someone suffer because of our sin than admit that we have sinned. Well, that's where we find Jonah today. He's on the run. He's disobeyed. He has sinned against the Lord. He doesn't want to bring God's message to Nineveh. But as we're looking at this passage, let's not just step back and be a spectator. Rather, we need to step into Jonah's shoes and see that oftentimes our hearts are right there on board that ship with Jonah. But remember last time we said that this book isn't just about Jonah. In fact, it's not even ultimately about Jonah. Rather, the book is about God. God's sovereignty, who he is as a sovereign God over salvation. And God hasn't forgotten Jonah. We're going to see that here. God has very much remembered him. And God is going to remind Jonah that he is sovereign. He is in control and he will have his way. And he's going to do that here with a storm. This is God's storm. And so we're just going to break this passage into four sections. Very simple points. First, verses 4 through 5, the storm begins. Second, verses 6 through 10, the storm continues. And third, verses 11 through 13, the storm worsens. And finally, 14 through 16, the storm is over. While the storm begins in verses 4 through 5, the text says, The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Amos 4.13 says, For behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind, and declares to man what is in his thoughts, who makes the morning darkness and treads on the heights of the earth. The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Amos declares the majesty and the sovereignty of God over all. That God even knows the thoughts of man's heart. What Amos declares, the men on this ship are now going to experience. The text begins with the words, the Lord hurled. Now this idea of hurling is a theme in chapter 1. We're going to see it over and over again this afternoon. And it's got the idea of precision. If we were to flip over to 1 Samuel 18, we would see there that this identical word is used when Saul hurls a spear at David trying to pin him to the wall. God didn't just close his eyes and drop a storm somewhere in the Mediterranean. No, there's a a target. There's a bullseye. He is hurling this storm at that boat. And it was a great, a mighty wind. Again, another theme here in chapter 1. And just to think about how mighty this wind was, think of the storm in Acts 27 when Paul was on the boat. The storm lasted 14 days before their boat broke up. This storm has barely begun, and their boat is threatening to break up already. God's sovereign hand is all over this storm. Well, verse 5 says, Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled, again, hurled a cargo that was in the ship into the sea 
to lighten it for them. Here again, we get another glimpse of how terrifying this storm was. These guys were absolutely frightened. They cried out each to their own God. They were polytheists. And kids, that means that they had many different gods. They would have had a God for the sky and a God for the rain and a God for the dry ground and a God for the sea. And each man cried out to his God. You know, we can think of even today the saying, there is no atheist on a falling plane. There's also no atheist in a sinking ship. When death is at the door, man sees judgment. And those who don't worship the living God should indeed be afraid. Notice they're willing to lose everything to save their lives. They hurl their cargo overboard. When death stares man in the face, earthly possessions seem to be worthless. Yet so often when life goes smoothly, don't we live like possessions are the only things we need? Jesus said, what will, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? When the shadow of death darkens our day, we quickly realize all our earthly gain, all our earthly wealth is nothing in comparison to our eternal condition. We have to ask ourselves, is what are we living for? What are you living for? Is it this world? Is it the possessions of this world? Or is it for Christ? Is it for the living God? I'm not saying that earthly possessions are evil. No, that's not what we're saying. The question is, what are you living for? For, for them or for God. These men, they learned how fleeting earthly possessions were. They just threw them over the edge of the ship. But what about Jonah? I mean, where did he go? Well, he's asleep. In fact, he's gone into the very inner parts, the very back corner of the ship. He's fallen into a deep sleep. Remember, we already said earlier that the idea of going down is a continuing theme. Here we have it again. He went down to Joppa. Now he's, he's gone all the way down to the very belly of the ship. And you know, for Jonah up to this point, it may have seemed that things are just going well. Things are going smoothly. God hadn't stopped him yet. I mean, he just walked over to Joppa, and he had the money in his pocket, and there was the ship. And he got on board, and away they sailed. Things were just going lovely. He even found a nice place to sleep. And what a deep sleep he was having. This word to describe Jonah's sleep is found two other times in the Old Testament. Once in Genesis 2, and another time in Genesis 15. Well, what happened in Genesis 2? God took Adam and put him into a deep sleep and took a rib out to create Eve. It was a sleep deep enough to perform surgery. Perhaps Jonah was even pleased with himself, how well things are going. But you know, we can be exactly the same, can't we? Perhaps you've sinned. Nothing's happened. God didn't strike you with lightning. Your business didn't fall apart. You know, that business deal, it went so well even though it wasn't really honest. 
maybe you lied about something a little bit. No one caught you. Perhaps you had that one look that you shouldn't have had. Nothing bad happened. You know, the patience of God is not for us to continue in sin. Rather, as Paul tells us, the patience of God is meant for us to turn to God in repentance, to come back to Him. God has been patient with Jonah from the moment he left. Are you on the run? Is God being patient and giving you opportunity to turn? Well, Jonah, he's going to learn the hard way that God doesn't ignore sin. So secondly, we see that the storm, it continues. Verse 6, so the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we will not perish. At some point in time, throughout their frantic, fearful, trying to save their lives, the sailors remembered Jonah. That there was this guy sleeping in the back of the boat. And the captain comes and finds him, and you can hear the despair and his voice, or the desperation. What do you mean, you sleeper? Don't you know what's going on? Now, when someone continues in sin long enough, their conscience can become so hardened, they simply won't see the effects of sin. That was Jonah. He's about ready to be shocked awake. We could say God's ready to push the button on the prod. Jonah's about ready to get the shock of his life. The captain says, arise, call. You know that feeling when you're booking down the highway, maybe going a little bit too fast? You got the music up, you're not paying attention. And you look in your rearview mirror, and all of a sudden there's those blue lights. And your stomach just kind of goes whoop up into your throat, and you go, oh, your knuckles go white, and you think he's got you. Well, that's Jonah right now. The captain uses two words that God said to Jonah on his commission Arise, call. These two words should have burned in Jonah's conscience. His mind should have just been on fire. This pagan captain is using these words now to tell Jonah to call out to the very God Jonah ran from. You know, when you come and hear God preach, or when you come to hear preaching or come to worship, the preacher not knowing your heart, not knowing the circumstances of your life, puts his finger right on a sin that you're dealing with or struggling with or perhaps ignoring. That's God doing the same thing calling out to you again, just as he is to Jonah, with patience. One more call, Jonah. Listen. Well, Jonah should have had an answer for these pagan sailors. He knew what was going on immediately. Yet he has nothing Nothing to say. These sailors, they're left to cast lots. And at this point, you wonder, 
did Jonah really think he was going to get away with this? I mean, after all of this, did, did he really think that he was going to escape this casting of lots, the extraordinary storm, the words of the captain? Not only that, he knew the scriptures. He lived after Solomon. He should have known the proverb, the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. God's sovereignty is all over this here. Jonah, he ends up being found out. The lot falls on him. There's, there's no escaping. And so in verse 8, the sailors, having seen the lot falling on Jonah, say, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And what people are you? Of what people are you? The questions, they come in rapid fire. They found the guilty party. They have no doubt that he's the man responsible for this catastrophe. Now they want to know why. I mean, they've lost everything. Their livelihood they've had to throw overboard because of Jonah. Their lives are at stake. Remember when you were a kid, and maybe you did something you shouldn't have, something foolish. Maybe you broke your mother's vase or something. And she catches you there in the house, surrounded by broken pieces of pottery. And she says, what were you thinking? Well, where did you get that stick from? Why were you swinging into the house, and what are you doing in here with these muddy boots? The accusations come, and you feel pinned in a corner. Jonah, he's got nowhere to run, so he might as well confess. So he says in verse 9, I'm a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Notice Jonah tells him his nationality and his God. But notice, this is no ordinary God. This one doesn't just rule the sky. This one doesn't just rule the dry land or just the sea. Not just one part of creation. No, this is the God, Jonah confesses, who rules heaven and earth and sea. This is the all-supreme God. And the sailors now recognize this. And Jonah knows it too. There's, there's nowhere to run here. We could think of Psalm 139. Where can I go from your presence? Nowhere. You can go to the bottom of the sea. You can't run from God. We see the realization of this in the sailor's answer to Jonah. When it says, the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of God or from the Lord because he had told them. The terror of these men is almost unbearable. It's exceeding fear. And it's not just because of the storm anymore. Nor is it because of some petty God, pagan God. No, this is because of the living God. You can't run from him. You can't row from him. You can't fly from him. These men would have been absolutely terrified. And now they are even more afraid that perhaps they are guilty by association and therefore under God's wrath. You know, these guys understood the insanity of what Jonah was doing. 
run from God? What are you thinking? This is absolutely nuts. But what about Jonah? Well, again, he's got absolutely nothing to say. He's got no good word for these guys. There's no repentance in Jonah's heart yet. He can't even answer them about his occupation. He didn't tell them he was a prophet. He's become so hardened that he won't even repent when faced with imminent judgment. We got to ask ourselves, how do we avoid this? This isn't just Jonah. We can all fall into this. Notice how easy it was for Jonah to go down this road. It was as simple as getting up and walking over to Joppa, reaching into your pocket for the money, walking over onto the boat and going to sleep. It was easy. Sin can be easy to fall into. How do we avoid it? Well, there's several ways to avoid it. Well, actually, I should focus on one mainly. It's the means of grace that God has given us. The means, simple, plain means that the Lord has set right in front of us. It's called the church. In Hebrews 3, the author of the Hebrews says, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Notice that the author of the Hebrews realizes sin is deceitful. It's easy to fall into sin because it's deceitful. And the way we avoid it is by faithfully coming to worship and hearing God's word. By faithfully exhorting each other daily to walk a holy life. I wonder, do we ever get past talking about the weather? Do we ever get past talking about our jobs or our kids to the point where we actually exhort one another to walk a holy life? Now, I've been around Redeeming Grace long enough to know that you guys have small groups. Here is an excellent opportunity, a simple means that God has given for you to exhort one another in order to avoid the deceitfulness of sin. Spend time in God's word and in prayer and devotion with God that you may not be on board with Jonah. While the storm, it just keeps raging, keeps getting worse. Verse 11 says, the men said to him, what shall we do to you that the storm may quiet down for us? It's apparent something has to happen to Jonah. Either he's got to repent or there's got to be punishment for him. The storm, it just gets worse and worse. I mean, it was bad enough before. Have you ever been in one of those situations where you just thought things couldn't get any worse? And then they did, and your heart just kind of sinks. How much worse can this get? Well, that's what's happening here. It's getting worse all right. God just keeps applying the pressure. These men, they realize God will have his way. He must be shown to be sovereign. And Jonah, he knows this too. So he says in verse 12, pick me up and hurl me 
into the sea, that the sea, then the sea will be quiet, will quiet down for you. Listen to this, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Here's a word hurled again. We saw God hurled the storm. The sailors hurled their cargo. Now Jonah says, hurl me. Well, I wonder what in the world is going on here. Are we talking about human sacrifice? No, we're not talking about human sacrifice. Rather, Jonah knows sin deserves death. You know, when someone has gone so far down into sin, they can convince themselves that they are simply too bad to be forgiven. They would rather bear their sin than look to the one who bore it for them. Yes, God's justice absolutely must be satisfied. He can't judge on a curve. Jonah's sin had to be paid. But this is the beauty of the cross, is it not? God could both be just and merciful at the same time. Well, we wonder how. We can think of Colossians 2 where it says that God took our sins and nailed them to the cross. There was a willing sacrifice on that cross. Christ came and willingly offered himself as a perfect sacrifice. God's justice could be satisfied. You know, when the world thinks of that kind of a sacrifice, they think it's absolute insanity. But it's even greater madness to reject such a sacrifice. It's even, even greater madness to say, I'm so guilty, God could never forgive me. The Lord said in John 3.16, He loved the world so much He gave His only begotten Son Jonah could have known this. Perhaps not in the same clarity you and I knew. But he would have known of David and the mercy God showed him. He would have known of other examples of God's grace. And yet, he's stubborn. Nevertheless, the men, they rode hard to get back to dry land. But they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. These guys, they're unwilling to kill Jonah. They're, they're going to try. The word here has the idea of rowing hard or digging through. This is intense. But God will have his way. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the day, in the body, whether good or evil. These men, they're afraid that the God who is pursuing Jonah will punish them for Jonah's blood. They know judgment's coming, and they don't, want to be, they don't want to be guilty of this man's blood. But at this point, what else can they do? They've got nothing left. So they do the very thing that Jonah simply refused to do. They pray. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done 
as it pleased you. The problem with humanity is pride. I can do it. I can row through this. I can make it. I will choose God. I can do something for my salvation. No, you can't. There's no salvation until you're where these sailors are or were. Where they cry out, Oh Lord, you have done as you pleased. I can do nothing. Lord, save me. There's no salvation until you see your utter helplessness and cast yourself in the arms of God. Only then will the storm of God's wrath cease. So they picked Jonah up and hurled him into the sea. I want you to just think of this picture because it's pretty vivid. Here's these sailors in this storm that's threatening to break up their boat. It's gotten windier and windier. These men are staggering all over the deck. They're holding on to whatever they can. The waves would have been crashing over the boat. They would have cast their lots in those conditions. Now they pray in those conditions. Well, there's Jonah. Silent. Nothing to say. I wonder if we were to look out our window tonight at the culture around us. It's in turmoil. They're lost. They are on a sinking ship that is going to the abyss. Perhaps we should say it this way. They're walking with their eyes wide open into the gates of hell. And you know the truth. Are you silent like Jonah? Or do you go out and tell your neighbors of Christ? Do you go out and tell your co-workers of Christ? Tell them that there is a Savior. And He has come to save all those who would come to Him. That the storms of God's wrath would be taken away from their soul. Well, here the sea ceased from its raging. We ask, was God's wrath, was His justice satisfied? Well, in a sense, not for Jonah. He has a ways to go down yet. But for the sailors, it was. And you may ask, well, how? Well, it's because they cried out to God. They called on Him for salvation. We can think of Matthew 8, where the disciples were in a storm as well. And they called out to the Savior, and they were delivered. Like Jonah, these guys have seen enough. When commentators said, we never feel Christ to be real until we feel him to be a necessity. Well, verse 6 tells us their response, or verse, I should say verse 16 tells us their response Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Notice that we've seen this idea of fear three times. First, they feared the storm. Then they feared God's anger. Now they fear God because of his 
mercy, and salvation. The proverb says, the fear of the Lord is the fountain of life, that one may turn away from the snare of death. The sphere has a knowledge. They see their need. They humble themselves in fear of God. They see God's mercy and they cast themselves upon His grace. And now with a reverent fear, with an awe and a thanksgiving, they bring their worship to God. There's no delusion in these men's hearts or their minds. No, they see that God saves the humble. God saves those who call out to Him. Lastly, I want us to think about our own lives for a minute. You know, these sailors, when they got up that morning, I'm sure they didn't go out to their boat thinking, today I'm almost going to die. Today I'm going to lose all my cargo. I'm almost going to lose my life. And Jonah, I bet you if you had asked him a year ago, will you run from God? He probably would have said never. Isn't it true for us as well? If I were to ask you today, will you commit adultery in a year's time? You'd probably say, no way. If I said, will you be in prison for a crime that you committed in five years? You'd say, uh uh, not a chance. Perhaps if I was to ask any newly married couple, or think about when you were newly married, would you strike your child in anger? You'd say, never. But think about the grace of God. We can fall so far. We can sin so badly. But think about it from two sides. From the side of the sailors. These men knew nothing about God. You could have been the bum on the street a drug addict, and the Lord could save your life and point you to Christ. Think about your own life. If it hadn't been for God's grace, you wouldn't be here today. You'd still be on the wide path. By grace that you are saved through faith. But think secondly of Jonah. It seems pretty dismal here for Jonah, doesn't it? It seems like God is just after him constantly. The storm, the words of the captain, the lots. And now he's hurled over the edge of the boat. Remember in verses 1 through 3, it says that Jonah was a servant of the Lord. He was called by God. He is a, a child of God. Think of the love of God for this man. Think of John 1, John 3. What love God has for us that we are called children of God. God will not forsake his people. No matter how far they fall. Oh, it's not an excuse for sin. Sin is costly. But the love of God is such that he will call us back. I don't know about you, but if it had been me on that boat, I would have thrown Jonah over a whole lot sooner than those sailors. 
I would have been happy to get rid of the guy the second I cast the lots. That's not the way our Heavenly Father works. God is not some tyrant in heaven hurling a storm at Jonah. Rather, as the author to the Hebrews tells us, the Lord disciplines the one he loves. God loved Jonah so much that he was not willing to allow his servant to continue on the path that he was going, but rather was willing to do all to stop him and turn him back. If you are a child of God today, God loves you. And know that even when you have sinned, He will not abandon you. Oh, the discipline, it may be painful. Think of David. How many of his sons did not die because of his sin? How many Israelites did not perish and lose their life because of his pride to know how big his army was? Discipline is painful, but it's loving. Why? It's because the Father loves the Son. And because in Christ you are united to the Son, and the Son will not allow any of His sheep to be lost. He will pursue you and bring you back even if he has to do it with his rod. That's ultimately what we see here with Jonah and with these sailors. Despite the appearance of wrath, that storm is filled with God's love. And you see God's love in the storms of life. That your heavenly father does absolutely everything for your good. And to draw you ever nearer to him. Let's pray. Almighty, glorious, eternal Lord. How wondrous are your ways. Father, we don't always understand your ways. We don't even always understand our own ways. Father, we don't understand why we are so stubborn, why we go our own way, why we would be the ones running to Joppa and sleeping in the back of the boat. Yet, Father, we thank you for your love your rich mercy, that you will not let us go, but that you pursue your own people to bring them back, even if it means discipline and painful discipline at that. We thank you that you love us, Father, and we pray that you would work it in our hearts that we would love you even more. That even when we have to be disciplined by you, we would look to your fatherly hand and worship you that you have not forsaken us. 